section. Um, it is uh, titled um, Local to Global, Unlocking the Potential of Indian Brands and Traditional Foods. So I'm the moderator. My name is uh, Sri Devi Annapurna Singh. I'm uh, currently serving as the director of CSER Central Food Technological Research Institute situated in Mysuru. And uh, I have uh, experience in uh, uh, developing high protein foods with the traditional taste to be safe, convenient, and cost effective for the past more than 30 years now. I think it will be simpler if I request my panelists to kindly introduce themselves so that to save time. My name is Tapashpal. I work as a lead environment specialist with the World Bank. I'm with the World Bank for about 25 years now. And I have not necessarily worked on food, food sector directly, but because I work on various sectors on uh, forestry, landscape, uh, coastal zone management, I have some, some few ideas probably that I can share today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yachneet Pushkarna. So uh, a couple of years back, ISKCON launched their food and beverage uh, brand, uh, which is called as Haribol. Uh, so I manage Haribol. Uh, we call ourselves as Seva. So I'm doing Seva at Haribol. And my background is FMCG and Pharma. Uh, thank you. Yeah, very good afternoon. My name is Sunev Haseen. I uh, look after the MTR business uh, for our client India. Uh, been with MTR for about eight years now. Uh, great to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Surubi Rajgopal. I'm with Selco Foundation. Uh, Selco Foundation is an organization that looks at uh, decentralized, sustainable energy and efficient equipment for last mile uh, farmers, micro entrepreneurs, SHGs, and uh, farmer producer organizations. So we work very closely on the decentralized energy and clean energy space for uh, last mile agro and food processing. Uh, happy noon, everyone. Uh, this is Omi the side. I'm a founder of Atpata, uh, which is a, a premix curry powder brand. And I've been a serial entrepreneur. And I'm there to speak on local to global. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good to see a full house post lunch. Uh, I'm Sanket S, uh, founder of Scandalous Foods. So we are a B2B company. We are a one-stop shop for popular Indian sweets for the restaurant and catering industry. Thank you all. Um, I think uh, you will all agree that we have a very eminent uh, panel with us today. And uh, coming to the topic, local to global and unlocking the potential of Indian brands and traditional foods, I think uh, uh, Indian food has been a popular uh, uh, menu uh, all over the world. It is supposedly the fourth most popular cuisine that is accepted uh, the world over. And today we do see a large number of Indians also settled abroad. Having said that, if you look at the Indian thali, what we call the plate, you will find that uh, we have a lot of uh, main items that are based on either millets or rice or wheat. We have pickles, we have dehydrated products that can be fried or roasted. And uh, we have a large number of mithai or sweets and desserts. We are having namkeens uh, or uh, salt and uh, savory items, all of which are highly popular. It is said that um, given the choice, an Indian, no matter how uh, good a global brand would be, would still about 80% of Indians prefer to have Indian food. Now, given this scenario and looking at Indian food, you will find that they are mainly localized. We like to eat our uh, food warm. It is usually having a lot of spice mixes. Again, these are very regional in nature. And they are generally uh, made from items that are seasonally available in that particular region. So often, it is served hot. And the problem with this is that the shelf life is low. But the taste has a very significant role to play in most of the food. 
Having uh, said this, now um, some of the driving factors for Indian foods include not just uh, um, the seasonal variation but also the cost and the taste. This has been uh, paramount. But uh, And the processing has been either roasting or it has been uh, fermentation, even uh, germination and uh, maybe frying, dehydration. All of these have played a very big role in the way we eat our food. Indian brands, unfortunately, have not made such a big uh, dent as uh, um, uh, many of the global um, multinational brands that we see today even in the Indian market. And uh, although India is number one, two or three amongst the top three producers of most of the agri produce, whether it is fruits and vegetables, whether it is grains and so on, we do have production. But processed food is not much. When you look at the exports, you will often find that primary processed raw material is what is uh, uh, dominating the export market. So if local foods have to become global, what is it that we really need to do? It, there are huge challenges. The challenge starts from the farm itself. You will find that uh, um, there are very small acreages and uh, different varieties of the grains are produced. Different varieties of the uh, produce are available. And you will get a mixed kind of uh, variety that is there available as raw material for processing. Often the variety that is grown in the farm need not necessarily be the best variety for processing. So many times you will have a lot of... Uh, um, uh, waste or byproducts that are there because of the processing, which means it is not very competitive. Many of the grains could be having higher amount of enzyme activity, which are actually adverse in nature and not necessarily extend the shelf life. So when you're thinking of global products from Indian traditional foods, we have to consider Apart from convenience, we have to also look into these that you are able to scale up this process. You have sufficient raw material and shelf life as well as safety. Today, sustainability has also become an issue. All of this needs to be uh, uh, considered. Now, when I talk about safety especially, there is both uh, the contaminants and pesticides and so on which are coming into the food, either ad uh, advertently or even adulterated, but there is also microbial safety. And you need an extended shelf life. And then today we are also talking about traceability. So all of this needs to be taken into consideration to see and throughout the supply chain we have to ensure these things. So uh, be it uh, transport, be it storage, be it the processing, then there, are, there is the labeling. Again, that is also a challenge. Many times there are several allergens that are coming into the food. We need to be sure. Sometimes our traditional foods do have a lot of health claims, but they are not necessarily scientifically validated. But throughout the shelf life, we have to ensure all of this if we want to make local to global. Having said this, I think uh, uh, the panel's uh, list will uh, um, be able to cover most of this. So uh, I would like to not take too much time now, but invite uh, Mr. Uh, Pushkarna, CEO and MD of Hari Hari Bowl uh, Dairy Products, to throw some light on the processing, building green supply chains, and the need for technology innovation for food packaging to promote traditional dairy products. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, giving me this opportunity. So, uh, to pick up from where you left, uh, you're right. I think um, Indian products are not that well known globally. Uh, you know, we are still uh, way behind the MNCs who have had a leap and bound of almost like two decades. Of course, our economy opened pretty late. So we also had to, uh, except of course for MTR, our dear friend here who has got a, a great presence. As ISKCON is uh, concerned, um, 
we of course, I was in Harvard just a couple of months back and they're actually writing a report on ISKCON being the first multinational uh, Indian brand to be present from Alaska till Fiji. So if you travel any country and ask ISKCON, everybody knows what ISKCON is, what Hare Krishna movement's been and so is Govinda's, the brand Govinda's associated with it. Now one positive side of that is it's always associated with quality. You know, like you said, of course it's fresh but it's quality. When we thought about uh, conceiving uh, a brand, uh, an FMCG brand, we had an array of uh, things to look at. One of them which came up right on top was the quality. Uh, today also, as you know, I mean, it's a price competitive game, especially in the uh, ethnic food sector outside India. China has, uh, you know, really spoiled the market in terms of price because we don't even know how, where, you know, the produce is coming from. So we thought as uh, Haribol and as ISKCON, as you know, being most, almost like 70 years uh, across the world, we need to bring in, the first thing is assurance to our customer that whatever he is consuming, it has an end mile uh, transparency. So we did a little research and we thought the biggest adulterant as of today, and I'm sure everybody sitting in this room has heard the Tirupati scam which has come up uh, where laddus were getting uh, made with beef stock and fish oil. Now, again, it's a price, uh, you know, people cut corners because of price. So what we did was we use AI technology and machine learning. And uh, as you know, ISKCON is all about uh, protecting the cows. We uh, did an intervention in Gujarat and we tagged all the cows with AI uh, tags. So even today, if you are buying a bottle of ghee from Haribol, you can actually check where the farm, from where the milk is coming from, live data from the cows. So now we are working more with these startups and we, there will be a way where it can even say what the cow consumed. So we wanted to use AI technology to actually bring in this level of transparency and assurance to the customer. Uh, once the customer is assured that we are using a certain, you know, quality parameters, we are high on this, then it is very easy to, you know, like yesterday even Piyush ji said, Honorable Prime Minister has said that we need to be, uh, as Indian products, we need to be there in terms of uh, quality. People should vouch by our quality. So that was our first route. So that's where we use technology. Now we are using the same in the spices and in the agri. So we are, I'm, yesterday I had a chat with uh, Honorable Minister Chirag Paswanji and we are giving him a proposal of collaborating with universities in the US and in IITs to bring IoT devices in farms. So we don't necessarily have to go through a, a process of certification. Now, certification is also depending, right? I mean, US FDA has a certain standard. I mean, you come from, you know, the core of this and you understand certain uh, elements are okay for them, certain are not. Parameters keep changing depending on whims and fancies of governments and, you know, how it is political. If it is AI technology, so if you pick up a brand of spices and if you can check the toxicity of the plant from the farms where it's coming from, you don't need FDA or this or that. I mean, it's live data. You can see live daily data coming in. So even the farmer will take care of taking care of making sure that he's not putting in because he's getting that value because he knows that, you know, the data is getting, it's his farm. At the end of the day, that's how connecting, you know, we're trying to connect that. So that's what Haribol's bridge has been. Uh, that's the, we've just started our journey. It's just been two years and uh, You've just taken from there. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very interesting insights that you uh, gave, especially about the farm and how you are using technology to. Uh, and focus I mean, I forgot to add, we this year won the World uh, Economic Forum Award at Davos for Faith in Action. Uh, we were top four in the world for about 200 uh, startups which were uh, looked at. Congratulations Thank you. for that. And, uh, 
Yeah. Um, so India is a very big country. We have around 20 agroclimatic zones, and the uh, variation in the raw material is quite huge. On the other hand, if you look at the food industry also, mainly we are uh, dealing with micro, small, and medium enterprises. So again, there is a lot of uh, variability. And, uh, uh, but we have a lot to offer to the world. India is the largest producer of millets, and uh, we have a large number of traditional uh, recipes. We have our very own ghee, what he said, which uh, we consider it to be very healthy, and uh, we want the world to also adopt that. So given this scenario, I would now in, uh, ask uh, Mr. Tapas Paul, uh, to please uh, talk about investing in, in infrastructure, policy advocacy for food exports, capacity building of SMEs, and economic impact studies to increase the potential of Indian traditional foods. Thank you, ma'am. A uh, whole lot of uh, topics there. And there are specialists who are sitting here. And it's very, very fortunate that I'm sitting with you, people who are leading this change that India needs. Uh, so I will not get into specifics, but let me make uh, uh, three uh, points which combine all of this infrastructure, public advocacy, uh, policy action, uh, action at the local level, all of those. So the first, uh, and, uh, let me have a qualifier. Uh, when I say any of these things, uh, we should always uh, remember what I'm uh, Paraphrasing Nandan Nilekani, whatever you think is true about India is also untrue in India. So, so there is no general rule in India that uh, follows. So even then, let me try to make uh, three general points. One is that uh, uh, to become global, from local to global, more emphasis is needed on local. For example, uh, we need, do not necessarily value our own food. I'm from Assam. I have never heard the name Puranpoli in Assam. We might have a bit of dosa and idli, but there are a whole range of Tamil Thali uh, things that I have never heard. It's not available. Even now it is not available. I can guarantee that you go to Bihar, you will not get Puranpoli. Now how do I convince global consumers to get Puranpoli if I have not been able to convince our own people to have this? Now, we need to, need to create a local demand for this traditional food from every place. And, and this is also borne out by some uh, facts. I mean, you all know that, I mean, in terms of our export targets, we are behind. We are like 1% of world trade in many cases. We are 0.36% in ready to eat, etc., etc. But within that, all of this segment, we are world leaders in two. Sweets and namkins. Now, how did that happen? That's probably because we convinced ourselves first. So, sweets and namkins are available every place, and therefore, you got there. The Jamnagar kachori was available in the domestic market before it started getting exported. Now, I think we need to actually create some infrastructure at the consumer end. There are food parks, etc., etc., being set up. But there is nothing to entice consumers, some infrastructure to entice consumers. You have a Delhi heart in Delhi, which does not necessarily serve all the recipes. I think we, have, we need to have it not in state capitals and national capital. We need to have at every district headquarter a uh, India food pavilion. And that infrastructure should be created. All states should be present there. All sh states should actually promote their traditional food, including the seasonal variations of all of those. And there should actually, states can be asked to uh, say, have, have the best cooks, best chefs, best uh, ingredients, best recipes, uh, recipes, and all the uh, things around that. We have 803 districts. It's not a big deal to ask from any of the states to operationalize this thing, a kitchen which will uh, manage 803 di uh, districts, 803 India food pavilions. This can be replicated in 803 other destination uh, worldwide. So this is an infrastructure at consumer and I think it's very important. Now along with that consumer we actually need to think about uh, other local food which is forgotten or getting forgotten. Whole lot of uh, food is getting forgotten and particularly uh, food which is based on forests, food which is based on tribal uh, 
uh, culture. Now, we have a preponderance of thinking about Indian food means sweet and namkin. But insects is also an Indian food. And there is a global market for that. We do not value it. And therefore, but uh, think about it. I mean, maybe North Indians are a 5,000 year civilization starting from Mahabharata. But Nagas are also a 5,000 year civilization from these times of Mahabharata. And if they can eat, eat insects, and these are edible insects, and there is a global market for that, we have to value that. So the place that we have, this India Food Pavilion, should have a lab to actually uh, generate knowledge about the forgotten food culture. I think our best uh, strength is diversity. Our best strength is actually forest products. If you think about tradition, uh, our forest dwellers uh, were not dependent on agriculture. You had ashrams. You, all the princes used to, prince and prince, uh, princesses, <laughs> we used to go to the uh, guru. And guru's uh, ashram did not have a supply from the king. Guru's ashram was uh, the place where the, uh, the shishas will go around the jungle and collect all of those things. So we have forgotten many of those things. For example, I mean, we have shawl seeds, which are wasted in this country. It is a proper alternative from cocoa. We don't value it. It's a wasted. We have not done anything about it. So we need to generate that local information, etc., etc., to be able to compete at the global market. So that's my first block of comment. Second block of comment, and which uh, uh, Sir has co covered already, that we do not, we do not need, uh, we need to actually think about quality and food safety as the brand. Now, as I said, everything does not, every rule does not apply universally, so there is not need to compete on cost on every product, every traditional product. Now, the global situation with respect to awareness for sustainability, climate change, uh, with respect to mental health, has given us an opportunity for promoting Indian food as a combination of food, nutrition, physical and mental well-being. Now, this is something we should capture. It will take maybe 10 years, but we should start doing this work. So, therefore, we need to actually see, see that our brand on quality is not tarnished. Maybe exports, our exporters are doing all the quality checks. But as long as our domestic consumers have adulterated food, margarine, turmeric, microplastics in every other product, Indian brand will not be established elsewhere unless we actually think about our own people. So when we export, you think about uh, um, uh, complying with European norms and other country norms. But when you supply domestically, you don't care about anything. So as if the life of an European is more important than an Indian. So we need to actually have the same standard across whether you are supplying domestically or export so that you have a brand value outside. And for that also, we need to actually think the industry should take the lead. All the food pavilions which are there should have a food testing uh, laboratory there. And some of the food testing should be offered free to people. Say, for example, I can go and test my food. So that's how we bring the awareness about food safety. And organized retail chains should be brought under traceability. Earlier session was about traceability. We have third what, three million people under TraceNet, maybe uh, one lakh people under MangoNet, et cetera, et cetera. There is no reason that, I mean, we should not have everybody under traceability, as, as long as the organized sector is there, organized restaurant. Uh, no no two-star, three-star, five-star hotel should be ser uh, serving you any food which is not traceable. So this is second block of comment. But all of this for a longer term, because if we want to take, say, 5% of global trade, we should be able to at least beat Belgium, if not Brazil. We need to actually believe in the purpose of it. The purpose is not earning a little bit extra money. The purpose is actually to believe that Indian food has a role to play. Historically, it has played a role. Uh, many of you may have heard Manishankaraya talk about fall of Constantinople and the role of Indian food. 
Mr. Gurumurthy is going around talking about how Indian food and food system and food habits is the way forward for the planet to survive. If people, if Western countries do not get converted into Indian style of eating, the planet may not be able to survive. So, we are not su suggesting vegetarianism. But in India, non-vegetarianism is actually, we eat uh, non-veg as one more vegetable. Like uh, there are five dishes and non-veg is one dish, fish or chicken or mutton. But elsewhere, the entire diet, entire plate is actually uh, animal protein. We need to actually, and that is not sustainable. Because in this world, more food is produced for animals to be fed than humans to be fed. Now, this is not the way we can go ahead. India has a great example to su suggest to the world because we not only support now the largest human population, but for many, many years we are supporting the largest cattle population in this country. With 2% of land, world's land, we are supporting 18% of world po human population, maybe 25% of world's cattle population. So that's a big thing. We have created this model of sustainability, we have to promote it. So India has a role to play in future of the planet. And therefore we need to think about this, this sustainability angle. Now if you want to promote sustainability, you have to be ahead of the curve. We should not have packaging material with plastics while we export. We should be ahead of the curve. We should not have uh, all other uh, problematic substances in our food. We need to actually concentrate on nutrition and therefore, again in earlier session there was a talk about tribal wisdom, etc, etc. Uh, now, the current uh, uh, PCCF, uh, Principal Chief Conservator of Forest in Rajasthan, he makes a big statement, is that India had a lot of drought and hunger in many years. Uh, uh, how you have innovated with uh, local ingredients and uh, uh, collaborated with um, brands to make uh, MTR a global uh, uh, phenomenon? So let me take a slightly different view uh, between, you know, all, all that has been said so far. Uh, I think we have spoken a lot about uh, building, uh, you know, infrastructure. We've spoken about maybe sourcing and how we need to be at, you know, great standards. There is immense potential of Indian food, no doubt about that. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, we need to break this discussion into a couple of parts. The first uh, part I would say is, um, one is how Indian food as part of ingredients can go global. And I think we have as a country and as a larger industry been focusing more around that, right? Um, I don't think we have added enough value, right? And we are still playing largely at a very commodity level. And it's... It's just, we are basically an ingredient into something and that's why the exports that go out of India are also largely at an ingredient level. If you truly want to make Indian food global, I think we need um, a great amount of uh, reimagination or maybe having a larger vision in terms of saying, how do I make Indian food relevant for rest of the world, right? Food will always, food actually doesn't satisfy your stomach. I have always believed that food speaks to your heart. None of the food brands are in the share of business for stomach, it's share of business for heart. And that's why the taste has to be paramount. You spoke about taste as the last, I would say taste is the starting point. If you don't deliver food that is appealing, food that is tasty, it will never ever you know, then the rest of the things actually, uh, you know, become uh, secondary. So I think what we haven't focused, and if you were to really look around globally, food has always evolved. Food is never static. Even in India, what we call today as our own traditional food has always evolved. And that's why the part of culture comes in. Culture is always also evolving. Uh, prehistoric times to now, you've had multiple migrations, you've had exposure to cultures, you've had different set of rulers. All of that has played into development of food, cuisine, something that we call, you know, uh, intrinsic to India today, 300, 400 years back was not there. Chili is not from India. Can you imagine a household in Chile to, that doesn't have chili today? Chili powder? Tell me, one household? No. Potato is not from India. Can you imagine a masala dosa without potato? Right? Uh, onions are not from India. 
so I can go on. Tomatoes are not from India. Food always evolves. And it obviously has been put in a way, of course, I'm still talking about ingredients, but the appeal got built up because people figured how to use that. People figured how to, you know, add taste or value into that. And in some way, that, that, that happened over a period of time. Our largest product sell, uh, selling product is gulab jamun. Gulab jamun is not Indian, right? But it's a part of today, all the festivals. How did it get ingrained into the culture? Uh, Pulyogare came from the temples, right? But it is a part of the Indian household. So I think what we need is a reimagination. Reimagination starts from understanding what the needs of the consumers is. That depends on how you will deliver a taste that is appealing to the target that you're talking to. You will never be able to, ma'am, like you said, be able to satisfy the needs of all the consumers because everybody has a different palate. Everybody has a different uh, expectation from the kind of food. That's where I think if you, even if you look around in India, the brands that have been successful is, have been the brands that have been able to take something and make something meaningful uh, of value to the consumers in terms of the taste that they are actually seeking. Um, our, our list is very long. Uh, you know, we have be, we've been able to do that. We have taken ingredients from temples. We've taken ingredients from local. We have invested a lot behind R&D, right? We have a cuisine center of excellence with more than 3,000 documented recipes. But that doesn't mean that those recipes can be just presented the way they were in the past. You have to make them relevant for today. Uh, taste has to be relevant. Format has to be relevant. Format is equally critical. If lives are becoming busier and more women are joining the work workforce and traditional family system is breaking, you will need to have, again, cultural context being uh, reset. You will need to have solutions which are not just tasty but also easy, right? Food knowledge is being, uh, is, is being diminished. People don't necessarily, uh, the next generation will not know about recipes as much as the previous generation. If you want to continue, you have to make it easy, right? So, but that is one part. So you talk to the consumers, give them the taste, give them the formats that they desire, and make sure that that is sticked. Then comes the second part, which is basically about competing, having standards that, that, that actually at the back end help you deliver uh, the kind of products that you're doing. There, I think we have to build a very strong ecosystem. The ecosystem needs to start from the farms. We need to have global standards. We need to have standards where we can assure quality of ingredients, we can assure uh, traceability, uh, and you know uh, all of those things that today the globe seeks out of any food product, Western markets, developed markets seek out of food products, we have to make sure that that gets done. That requires uh, a, a large collaborative effort between uh, you know, the government and maybe the social sector as well as the private sector. We need to build an ecosystem which helps you support that. We are still largely a poor country. We have to take care. All these solutions have to be built at scale so that the farmer is able to benefit, the larger consumer is able to benefit, and you know, you know, we have to do it the way we have possibly done around UPI, maybe something of that scale and that uh, imagination needs to be done. The, the, and then second part on the back-end development is processing. Um, a lot of our industry, if you were to look around today, food processing industry as it exists in India, uh, most of processing has been imported from outside. Whether it is potato chips, whether it is noodles, whether it is biscuits, we have been able to do that because we were able to dip into some other you know, knowledge base. We were able to pull that in and then you know, implement it over here. Again, an ecosystem needs to be built. And I think CFTRI can really help us there. The industry needs to step in uh, and step up and the government needs to come in. Again, building how we can actually use, uh, you know, we can, we can build uh, machinery, we can build processing um, uh, solutions which help us take, you know, the raw materials and the great food that we have, but then convert it into uh, something that adds, uh, you know, in a format, in a way uh, where costs are taken care of, tastes are being able to deliver. We need a lot of R&D over there. We need a lot of innovation over there. And like I said, this piece needs to be completely reimagined. Otherwise, we'll continue to talk uh, still at a very uh, basic level. And uh, that's, that's the perspective that I have. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, very interesting to hear from the industry perspective. And uh, 
uh, as an R&D institute, we're always ready to collaborate and uh, make Indian traditional foods uh, popular. Uh, and then we've had a lot of uh, work that we've done yes. with CFTR right? yeah, and look forward to continuing to do Surely. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, also, you touched upon a very uh, significant gap that we have been adapting uh, machines that are meant for other grains to our indigenous grains and therefore the overheads are adding up and we are neither competitive nor are we able to maintain the taste yeah, uh, and traditionally. The machines don't necessarily work and then yes. you know a lot of modeling, remodeling needs to happen. That also requires significant investment and effort. Yes. And yeah. So if the government's dream of doubling the farmer's income has to be realized, I think value addition is the way to go. Uh, till now, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on the agriculture, but now probably post-harvest uh, processing, the time is ripe to look at it. So uh, our uh, next uh, panelist I would like to uh, call upon is Ms. Surabhi Rajkopal. And uh, I hope you will be able to talk about empowering rural producers and value chain enhancement. Again, a very, very important sector because, like I said, MSME is what is there in India, especially in the food sector. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of our colleagues here are coming from the food sector. Um, I'm coming in from the... Uh, energy, innovation, and infrastructure sector, which probably feeds well into the point that uh, Suneji was making around, you know, what is the kind of infrastructure at the farm level and at the post-harvest processing level. Um, we are working primarily f with, uh, like I said, rural farmers, rural entrepreneurs, women self-help groups, and farmer producer organizations, right? So a critical part for us of strengthening that local supply chain is really how do you strengthen their productivity? How do you reduce drudgery at the level of the micro-entrepreneur? And how do you improve, uh, you know, their resilience to shocks, whether that shock is in the form of a COVID-19 crisis uh, and a lockdown, or whether that shock is in the form of floods and cyclones that affect livelihoods in Assam and in uh, Odisha. So maybe just to think about why is, uh, why does, you know, efficient equipment, innovative technologies and decentralized energy even make a difference in the, in, in this entire production cycle and strengthening local, uh, local food systems. Um, one aspect of that is really, uh, at the on-farm level, you know, our uh, colleague from uh, Haribol, Pushkarnaji, spoke about uh, farmer, uh, dairy farmers, and procurement from dairy farmers to be able to look at the dairy value chain. Now, procurement from dairy farmers involves uh, often women who are milking the cow at 5 a.m. in the morning and then again at 5 p.m. in the evening. Uh, it involves um, input for feed, cattle feed, uh, where in dry lands, in the absence of green fodder, you end up with only dry fodder, which affects the productivity of, which affects the fat content of milk and therefore the income generation that's possible, right? Do, can we look at solar powered uh, hydroponics units that produce green fodder that complements the dry fodder that is available. And dairy is often a supplementary income source for farmers in dry land areas and in areas where um, drought uh, and arid you know, summer times are high. So we want to make sure that the income that they can get from that milk is also of good yield. Um, so something like a hydroponic solution enables not just climate resilience on the ground, it improves productivity for that farmer. A solar powered milking machine for each of these dairy farmers who are involved in the milking process itself, right? That reduces drudgery significantly. It, it reduces mastitis and, um, uh, you know, improves the health of the cow when, when we look at the last mile consumer uh, involved. Oh, sorry, the last mile producer involved, right? That is a big part of drudgery reduction and building resilience of these last mile farmers who are providing the input into the food system. Um, coming to post-harvest processing, production and post-harvest processing, uh, let's take the example of millets since we, we want to look at millets uh, within the Indian context. 
a lot of millet production in the country um, uh, where farmers are being encouraged to grow millets. Some of the hesitations that they have is where am I supposed to go process this millet? Uh, you were also pointing out that a lot of the uh, processing technologies are for certain grains. So when you look at the farmer who is growing millets in um, rural Kalahandi in Odisha uh, or in North Karnataka uh, regions, uh, Dharwad and uh, Raichur, uh, what the farmers are saying is that for me to access the nearest centralized mill to process my millet is about 30 to 60 kilometers away. Once I go there, the centralized mill may or may not have reliable electricity supply and therefore I spend a whole day there. The centralized mill is then using diesel as a backup to be able to actually uh, cover the production for the day, right? How do you decentralize that process? Bring in a self-help group that owns a millet processing unit that looks at anywhere between 100 kgs to 1000 kgs processing per day that covers a certain jurisdiction within that area. What you're doing is you're enabling the farmer to then choose how much of that produce they want to process and keep for themselves and how much of that they want to sell on. A large part of strengthening local value chains is also to strengthen local consumption. And we cannot talk about millet, um, you know, the millet value chain and sector growing unless we're talking about millet consumption strengthening at a local level. So uh, looking at decentralized solar powered millet processing units where there are a lot of innovators now in the market that are very decentralized in a ground level. You know, they don't have the, they may not have the names and the faces that will create the biggest Excel sheets and PowerPoint presentations to present to venture capitalists. But these are entrepreneurs on the ground that are innovating on technologies and looking at how millet processing can happen at a decentralized level, where women self-help groups, for example, in Odisha, um, just yesterday, one of these uh, smaller FPOs is owning a millet processing unit and has uh, started, uh, um, uh, you know, looking at processing within that jurisdiction, covering their 200 to 300 farmer base itself. And that becomes an income source for the FPO. So when we're talking about strengthening FPOs as a country, it's not just input linkages, it's their ability to do processing. It's their ability to look at decentralized cold storage solutions available at the farm gate, so that perishability, which was a, a point that ma'am was making earlier, if you're taking it, if you're taking your produce to the market, how do you make sure that wastage and losses are avoided? If I'm a farmer who is trying to harvest my produce and trying to, um, uh, you know, sell it in, sell it to the middleman, there's a certain value that I get. If I'm selling it to the farmer producer company that is able to sell it on, there's a certain value that I get. As an FPC or an FPO, can I make a business out of um, processing, out of cold storage, all at a more decentralized level? So how do we really strengthen infrastructure for last mile communities and make sure these communities can function independent of whether there's a landslide in Meghalaya where the pineapples are amazing and should ideally be able to go out, but because of the infrastructure and terrain, they're not able to leave the, the state as easily. How do we enable decentralized processing, decentralized storage, uh, and decentralized uh, transportation infrastructure that is solar powered to be able to do that? Um, and I think I'll just end with two quick points, which is we've been able to look at the uh, uh, Pradhan Mantri formalization of micro enterprises, the PMFME scheme of the Ministry of Food Processing Industries, to really strengthen these last mile individual entrepreneurs, SAGs, and FPOs. So these are millet processing units, rice processing units, uh, oil expellers, sugarcane juicers, refrigerators for petty shops and canteens. And these are the kind of micro enterprises that are being enabled on the ground through this process. I think there's a need for more innovations, whether it's through NIFTEM, whether it's through um, CFTRI, to bring in innovators at the last mile who are grassroots or who have understood and worked on the problem to support them in actually strengthening that um, supply chain on the ground. 
Um, looking at schemes like PMFME and unlocking those schemes, so far in the last one year, we've unlocked about 250 such loans across Karnataka, Odisha, and the Northeast. Um, and I think the third is how do we strengthen public, social public procurement from these kind of last mile um, food processing entrepreneurs, SAGs, and uh, FPOs. Um, and hopefully that procurement can go into brands like these to really see the global side of things. Thank you. Thank you so much for highlighting the ground reality and the problems faced by the MSME and the farmers. Um, I would also like to tell you that uh, uh, institutes have been making efforts to uh, develop clusters and, you know, common, but we are a big country and uh, every 10 kilometers the food varies and the language is a challenge many times in capacity building. But I'm sure we will overcome these to become truly global and reach out the traditional foods to the world. So uh, one of the problems of uh, the food industry in the country, especially the MSME, is the branding and the design of the packaging and so on. So uh, these need to be very, very uh, uh, important. They play a role uh, in attracting the customer to actually buy the product. So I invite the next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Uh, Kultia, uh, to please uh, share your views. Hi guys, uh, I'll be covering up all the points, local to global. I'm also exhibiting in International Pavilion. So I'm a pure D2C brand and uh, I have been wearing multiple hats as an entrepreneur, but food was something which was very close to me since I born. So uh, nonetheless, I was running a travel business. After COVID, I shifted to the food business and I wanted to make it as a D2C brand. And I lived half of my life in Australia, so I had a lot of struggle to have a local food, what I wanted to crave, and I was, I was like dying for it. I never thought, uh, even after having money, I have to starve and I have to look for a local foods, right? So that's when the idea popped up in my brain and I just started a brand called Atpata, which means unusual. So uh, when I talk about my colleague is there, which must, uh, like, you know, uh, Mr. Fasheen, what he has told about the 3,000 recipes that he's having, and also I have raised the questions to the ministry yesterday. As an entrepreneur, we have to hustle a lot uh, in, in order to make uh, one product because uh, we have to go through with a lot of uh, challenges in terms of getting the approvals from the lab, from the nutritional facts and the FDAs and the other things around. So we do not have any, uh, any facility or any kind of uh, governing body who can help us in order to achieve one product. Because yesterday the same round table where we, I think we shared the uh, table with the uh, Haribol, like I shared the table with you yesterday. So I have raised this question to the ministry also. So we needed to have one particular, uh, you know, governing body from where we can procure the raw materials. So the moment we have a good raw materials and uh, the same kind of frequency and the taste, we can able to make a one good local food and moreover, as, I, as a D2C brand, as I thought that, yeah, I want to take it to the Australia or to the New Zealand. In the morning also, I had one instance, like uh, I was on the booth, I was on the stall. So there's a guy called, uh, one guy from Argentina, he's also exhibiting there. So he came on, walked on my stall and then he was asking, what is this uh, achari aludam? I said, uh, and then they, I said, this is a local recipe of North Indian people. And then he popped up into the... Moringa paneer, which I created instead of palak paneer. So our PM has spoke a lot about Moringa, and I'm doing a lot of international projects with the Moringa. I'm doing the farming of the Moringa also, which helps us in the uh, you know uh, sustainable uh, development also in carbon emission. So he was telling me, can I use this Moringa paneer instead of uh, uh, instead of paneer? Can I use chicken? Can I? And I have a lot of Indian fertility in Argentina, so. After that, the same uh, Australian has come, the New York, uh, the US people had come. They all were showing their interest in terms of these kind of recipes. So I really feel there's a very big gap from, you know, uh, uh, exporting the product from India to abroad in the international market. We face a lot of challenges, which I think our government has to uh, give us a lot of channel where we can solve this problem. As an entrepreneur, we have to look after every single department from procurement to the raw material to making it uh, ready and get the pH level, all that 
uh, nutritional fact to getting it to the consumer home. So what I feel is uh, we have a lot of potential. Our local recipes are worldwide celebrated. When I go abroad, when anybody of us, we talk about the local food, as ma'am has already said, that each 10 kilometers after the recipe changes, the taste changes. So uh, yeah, I'm a food lover. So I have already invested my half of the life during the f eating foods, all kind of foods. So being a food enthusiast, I personally feel that yeah, we can definitely break the barriers. Barriers. We are the uh, we are the people who can, who have a lot of uh, brands like a Haldiram and MTR and the other brands which are already established, which we see them in the international market. But the government has to help us in order to ease down this exports and in order to achieve these recipes and uh, you know to place our local food into the international market. Uh, that's all from my side. Right? Uh, moreover, I think international uh, market can be achieved through a lot of social media platforms, which is like, moreover, I personally feel Instagram is the best one. And uh, we have, yesterday we had a session, there was someone who was complaining about, uh, to Mr. Piyush uh, uh, Goel and uh, to Mr. Chirag Paswan when I was in the round table, that some of the brand using the brand identity and they're copying them and they're misrepresenting those brands into the world and maybe they're doing the duplicacy. So they also immediately have taken an action, they have taken a note of that same. If such kind of uh, assurance will come from the government, I don't think so we have any challenges to go local to global and uh, we can go zero to 100 as no time. Thank you so much, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, interesting points on innovation. I would love to try Moringa Paneer. And uh, I think uh, all of so us much, uh, love food, and that is why the hall is full also. <laughs> uh, having said that, I think we move to the, uh, the last panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Sanket, who has a very interesting company called Scandalous Foods. I would love to hear his uh, ideas about uh, what are the challenges faced by the Indian food brands in maintaining global quality and uh, anything else you would like to add, including uh, promoting transparency and so on, please. Thank you, ma'am. So the good thing about being the last panelist is, uh, you know, I can just end up saying that whatever I wanted to say, they've already said, yes. the esteemed panelists. So uh, anyways, so, um, you know, I think it was, it's very interesting that we're talking about local to global. Uh, I would uh, break this into two parts, the back end and then, uh, you know, the front end and promoting our food globally. Uh, to b I would begin with uh, the point that ma'am made uh, in the beginning about, uh, <clears throat> you know, India being number one, two or three in producing most of the agricultural products. But uh, in terms of food processing, we are infants. I think it's because uh, India is majorly a commodity country, right? Uh, for us to see the light at the end of the tunnel, we'll have to move from being a commodity country to becoming a product country. I mean, we waste more agriculture than Europe even produces. Uh, so, uh, you know, if uh, uh, people like Surbi, I mean, the work that they are doing, if the, uh, the agriculture uh, wastage reduces, and we convert most, most of the agriculture produced into processed food, we'll obviously become a product country and then you know we can compete with the likes of the US in this field. Uh, also, uh, to do this, we need to enable uh, uh, ourselves with a lot of automation in, uh, in, in terms of equipments, right? Like Mr. Basin said, that uh, you know, whatever has come from the West, there is amazing automation, like, you know, if we talk about bakery and all of that. But in terms of Indian food, uh, you know, I mean, the, there is still very lackluster equipments available. Like, you know, if we talk about even mithais, for example, we have to now look to the pharma industry to bring in automation into the mithai industry. Uh, there is no real automation. I mean, you know, I, there is still so much scope of R&D that can be done within the uh, equipments that need to be made for Indian and Indianized products. Now, talking about uh, taking Indian food uh, global, I think, you know, uh, I, I was hearing all, you know, whatever we all were saying. Uh, we, you know, when we are taking Indian food 
टू द ग्लोबल ग्लोबल प्ले वी के नॉट से हम आसाम का खाना लेके जाएंगे या हम बॉम्बे का खाना लेके जाएंगे वी के नॉट प्ले एज अ स्टेट वी हैव टू प्ले एज अ कंट्री राइट नॉट एवरी फूड विल सी यू नो विल बिकम ग्रेट ग्लोबली लाइक यू नो फॉर एग्जाम्पल आई थिंक बटर चिकन और चिकन टिक्का मसाला टुडे हैज़ बिकम अ नेशनल फूड इट्स नो लॉन्ग अ पंजाबी और नॉर्थ इंडियन फूड इडली हैज़ बिकम अ नेशनल फूड इट्स नो लॉन्ग अ साउथ इंडियन फूड सो वी विल हैव टू सी वॉट सर्च प्रोडक्ट आई हैव नाउ बिकम नेशनल फूड्स एंड फर्स्ट वील हैव टू टेक दैम ग्लोबली एंड थिंक अबाउट इट सो यू नो वैन लेट्स ए पास्ता केम टू इंडिया यू नो वी गेव इट आर इंडियन तड़का वैन चाइनीज फूड केम टू इंडिया वी गेव इट आर इंडियन तड़का सो इफ वी हैव टू टेक इंडियन फूड आउटसाइड let's say if we to make uh, you know some indian food popular in the us we'll have to uh, indianize the western food that is available there and that is how our food could become popular there and of course compliance adherence is or westernized or westernized the indian food right yeah so in fact uh, uh, like uh, mr masin said that you know his top selling product is uh, gulab jamuns so uh, after selling my company urban spice in october 2019 and then post the pandemic when uh, we founded scandalous foods as a one stop shop for popular indian sweets we realized that we cannot compete with the mdrs and the haldirams of the world by making tin gulab jamuns right so what we did was we realized that while these guys are already capturing the the you know the celebrations and the occasions market we realized that mithai is not available in the uh, impulse by uh, space impulse buying happens at certain moments of consumption that is post meal usually right so we took to the ice cream playbook we realized 50% of the ice cream sales is impulse buy because they are available with a shelf life they are available in convenient packaging and they are available in a distribution network which appeals to the post meal buyer and that is what we did with mitais uh, we got first the classics because most indians and in fact most people globally also Uh, we all talk newness uh, but we consume familiarity so we first took the classics we took gulab jamun rasmalai gajal halwa mung dal halwa popular sweets across india we got them in single serve format six month shelf life preservative free and we uh, we took restaurant industry as the distribution channel to reach the post meal impulse buyer right so we'll have to take leaves out of things we do as startups and uh, you know replicate this at the global level Uh, for us to you know kind of uh, <clears throat> put the indian food at a global plateau i mean and it's time that indian food will explode globally i mean baklavas have exploded across the world italian food has exploded across the world so it's time for indian food to explode across the world i think we just need to learn to glamorize our food as the westerners do you know hum abhi bhi bolte hain chole bhature bechenge gulab jamun bechenge so you know like the other day i was Uh, uh there was this uh, australian lady who was having our gajar halwa and she's like is this like a vegan carrot cake and you know it struck me that okay i mean there was mawa in it but if you remove the mawa mawa we can go and promote it as vegan carrot cake across the world uh, actually samosas i've taken some virgin atlantic flights out of london not to india other destinations samosa is there as their midday meal uh, one of their mid meal Between Actually, I think the Australian Prime Minister spoke about it, right? Yeah. Like the, so samosas have become samosas. now international. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you know, I mean, there's, uh, I think, uh, I think Tapasji or uh, Tapasji spoke about most of the Westerners eating a lot of meat in their food, and that's why they are like, you know, talking uh, talking a lot about becoming vegan. In fact, you know, most of Indian food is vegan inherently, right? So if we promote it well. Uh, a lot of our snacks that are being sold uh, globally but targeting the indians you know we are all just taking advantage of the fact that our indian diaspora bahut bada hai we are 2 crore indians even outside of india and we are selling all this food that we are exporting from here to the indians there so we could actually sell our snacks as vegan snacks to a lot of you know foreigners there and uh, you know i mean uh, tap into the vegan market why why eat all the soy in the world when we can eat such good uh, vegetarian food which is available which is inherently vegan in nature yeah so i think i would uh, sum it up with all these points yeah uh, thank you very much it was indeed uh, i do agree with you that we are a commodity driven market more than 
a product uh, um, uh, yeah <laughs> So uh, it is a challenge for some of the Indian foods, definitely, because like I said earlier, that we like them warm and we like them fresh. But there are many, many uh, other Indian foods that could become uh, global. And even in India, I do see, although they said, uh, you said that uh, idli is no longer a South Indian, but if you ask a South Indian, they would like the white fluffy rice cake, what you call is the idli, but you find uh, masala idlis, you find uh, all other kinds of idlis with toppings on it today. So Indians have also started innovating a lot and you find uh, fusion dosas, not necessarily with the potato masala, but uh, many other uh, items also. And, uh, but Again, marketing and branding is a challenge. I remember um, my mother telling me that when she was in school, uh, they used to uh, put the leftover rice in a mud pot, a clay pot, and uh, top it with uh, milk and a little bit of uh, culture uh, from the curd. And the, ne the next day morning, that was what the children were given before they went to school. And we have now adopted uh, cereals, breakfast cereals, branded breakfast cereals. And in England, I hear that they sell probiotic breakfast, <laughs> which is nothing but this uh, curd uh, uh, rice that uh, we used to have maybe uh, 70, 80 years ago in India. So somewhere the branding and the marketing is where probably there is a lot to be uh, done. Having said that, I, uh, I think uh, you will all agree that uh, very valuable insights have come from this panel. And if anybody has any views or would like to ask uh, the panelists, I invite, uh, yeah. Yeah, a very good afternoon to all the panelists. I'm Harshit from Tamil Nadu, and we deal with uh, uh, plantains from Tamil Nadu. So, ma'am, hope you are aware of the plantains which are grown around Mysore areas. And uh, we have a strong root in the plantain trading. And when, as a new entrepreneur and a second generation entrepreneur, when I think of adding value to that plantain, the one product that has a market cap is the yellow plantain chips that every people know about it and when we plan uh, uh, expect to do some r and d work on we don't have the resource to do as a small entrepreneur and we approach um, institutions like niftem cftri and uh, stuff but there we were not able to afford the processes so any initiatives or subsidies uh, institutions will offer for uh, new startups or uh, new entrepreneurs in the field of r and I, I suppose there are uh, subsidies and uh, available for infrastructures. So that's my question to you, ma'am. Uh, okay, you're asking me the question, uh, right. Thank you for that. Uh, see, and Sorry to interrupt. And one more question to Mr. Uh, Sunai Basin. Sir, uh, MTR had uh, the product of banana chips in the brand of Snack Up and mm. I think that was discontinued, if I'm not wrong. Sir, what is your view on this range of traditional products in the international market? And why are they not gaining attraction in the international market? If you can add two points on that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, like I said in the beginning, you have a large variety of raw materials that is available. Not all the varieties are really suitable for processing either. Now, uh, what we find is many of the inquiries that come to our institute, people are very particular about a certain uh, availability of raw material from that region. And they want solutions for that. So while we are able to give you at a low price a generalized solution, you are looking for very particular solutions, which means that R&D necessarily has to be done. 
Now, uh, when we talk of R&D and developing a technology, you need engineers, you need uh, basic uh, uh, people, you need somebody to test, you need packaging experts, you need, uh, you know, uh, scale up, so many of this. So you are accounting for their time and uh, their uh, uh, salaries. So naturally, it is a little bit expensive proposition for a small entrepreneur. But if you look at it globally, we are very, very affordable, yes. Another alternative is as an incubator. Many of the institutions, whether it is NIFTEM or CFTRI or any of the food-related uh, uh, institutions, including the ICAR ones, are having incubation facilities today. So you don't have to invest uh, too much then, but you could come over, you will get the mentorship, you can use the machinery that is available there for a lesser cost. Bring your raw material, do it there, take it back and see. But like I said, each variety has a specific composition. Please do not forget that some of them may be, for example, uh, having higher polyphenolase activity, which means that the browning will be faster that may not necessarily be suitable for the unit operation you want to do like chips, where you are frying at a higher temperature, it will become brown, and then you're not happy with the quality. So some other may have a different kind of a problem. That is why I said we necessarily need to do R&D when you talk of a very particular uh, raw material. But generalized, we can give you at a very cost-effective price or even free. If you visit our website, we have around 22 technologies we are offering free of cost. You don't have to pay us a single uh, rupee. Yeah. yeah, so when you, uh, you spoke about stack up. So let me first tell you that as a business, we are always constantly, you know, looking at all the opportunities mm -hmm. that are available. We assess, reassess our portfolio. And then we obviously take calls that are in interest of the business. Having said that, in this case, I would say, you know, you have to look at any product as, I mean, any offering, I wouldn't call it a product, any offering as sort of a, uh, a triangle intersection between taste, price in India is very, very critical, and then, you know, I would say quality, quality and consistency, I'm using it interchangeably. So for us, I think uh, to be able to do this at scale uh, and to be able to do this at a price that, you know, the consumer would feel good about and we would be able to sort of uh, you know, give a product consistently were, were all issues, and uh, we don't think we were very happy with the, you know, with, this, with the level that we had reached at that time. So that was the reason we decided to take a step back on that. Yeah. Ma'am, when you're referring about local food going global, and I was thinking about one um, example, um, I have not seen a single country where the cup of noodles is not available. So that's because it's convenient. Okay, so Indian food becoming more convenient, and so now you mentioned about making it more convenient could be a great way for Indian food to scale globally. So, it, because Indian curry everyone loves, but don't, nobody likes to make it. So when you look at the Western market, so making it convenient. But in our experience, so we made a flour out of the green jackfruit uh, for diabetes. But till we did the clinical trial, there was no traction because the health claim was important. So I mean, my request to CFTRI is, you know, as a country, we need to invest more in clinical trials so that we can make that. So health will be the next big change I mean, after convenience. Then will be health will be a big pull for us to I mean, attract the global market. So there we need to be more proactive in investing in clinical trials to demonstrate health benefits, even for millets. That'll be my request. Yeah. Yes, uh, we are already doing that. In fact, uh, we are uh, uh, partnering with uh, uh, Sikras in uh, Bangalore and uh, under the Ministry of Ayush, uh, where they have given us the traditional Ayurvedic recipes. And we are trying to scale that up and actually look at uh, animal studies to validate the health claims. And then we go for clinical trials. It will take some time. But already uh, many such uh, studies are uh, being undertaken already. It will be a game changer if we can fast Surely. track. Yeah. And also um, uh, somebody was talking about uh, uh, westernizing Indian foods or Indianizing Western foods. Uh, here I would like to tell you, uh, India is the largest producer of millets. 
But if you really look at the production, it is around 19 million uh, metric tons, whereas rice and wheat are over 300 million metric tons. So we cannot even feed our own population. Forget about exporting millet products. So first of all, we have to increase the production of that. Then we have to look at the processing. We have to look at the machines that are required to process these millets. So right now, in this is my personal opinion, but the poor were eating that, the rural folks were eating that food because it gives better satiety and they were able to remain without eating for a longer period of time. Now it has become a fad and it has become expensive also. So they are not getting their own staple and uh, it is getting polished to a larger extent because again, like I told in the beginning, the shelf life has to be increased for which case we have to remove the lipase layers. And that means most of the fiber and the vitamins and minerals are being removed there also. So are we really getting that nutrition? Come to the testing. Whether you add 2%, 20%, 40%, right now we are not in a position to test how much of millet is there in the millet product. Having said that, institutions are uh, doing their bit to understand all these challenges and to address them. So recently we have tried to Indianize the McDonald's bun by adding millet to it, and it will be available in 400 uh, outlets in south and west of India. And uh, hopefully a uh, little more uh, nutrition would be coming from uh, uh, these kind of products. So that is happening, but it has to be accelerated, and uh, hopefully it will go global then. And I'll share one, you know, because of one randomized control trial we did, jackfruit has come back to the center of the plate in Kerala. The consumption of jackfruit has come back. So it is, it is, it's very impactful if we can demonstrate with you know, um, human trials. So uh, another experience I would like to share is each entrepreneur who comes, they want to have their USP. So uh, the way you are processing it, the amount you are marketing, it could be having that clinical effect. But it's not necessary that any jackfruit area from anywhere that you take will have the same effect. It would depend on the way it is processed. So there has to be a kind of standardization across the country to prove that that is the uh, maturity level at which it has to be processed and it should have that same clinical effect. That's that some, needs yeah. to be done. done yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All the best to everyone. I think we can go global. <laughs> so uh, if there are no more uh, questions, uh, anybody else would like to ask? OK, then I take this opportunity to, first of all, to thank the organizers for giving me uh, this role of uh, moderating this session. And I think you will all agree we had uh, great experts from across the fields, whether it was the World Bank or from a traditional uh, Indian food industry or uh, a global uh, uh, food uh, brand, uh, entrepreneurs or even the um, NGO. So all of them gave their uh, um, great uh, uh, insights into it. And I'm sure that uh, with the kind of energy that was there today, India will soon become the global leader even in uh, Indian traditional foods uh, reaching out to the rest of the world. Thank you all. Thank you.